you, Coach, for having me on to present today. Uh, my name is Michael Vassell. I am the offensive coordinator and offensive line coach at Becker College. Um, going to talk with you guys today just a little bit about uh, the overall offensive line play, everything from starting to build a philosophy and a culture within your offensive line room uh, to basic fundamental stuff that we do every day that I think you, you all could easily incorporate if you wanted to. And then looking at some of the essentials with some of the <clears throat> basic blocks needed for certain run schemes as well as pass protection. Uh, a little bit about myself. I'm a former Division I college offensive lineman. I played at NC State. Um, I've been coaching going into now my 11th season. This will be my second year at the college level. Before then, I spent nine years coaching high school ball. I am always open and available to answer questions. I love talking ball. Um, on the screen here, you can see both my email address and my Twitter handle. Uh, feel free to reach out if you ever have any questions. I also accept hate mail if you think I'm horrible, but I'm joking. I'm sure I'm not that bad, but uh, yeah. So the first thing that we're going to cover, um, as I mentioned, is offensive line philosophy. So again, for me, offensive line philosophy, we're going to talk about what shapes my coaching style, my teaching process, and, the, and how I try to build an offensive line meeting room. All right, so uh, philosophy uh, with me and teaching. Uh, it comes in two parts, a physical approach and a mental approach. So the first thing, and everybody is always so focused on this, and it is an important aspect because it is what we physically do. So with our physical approach, um, the first thing that we want to instill in our kids is understanding the eight angles of football. Um, the eight angles of football is one of many wonderful tools I've picked up from OLP and the Charles Bentley through um, the information they've been spreading. Um, the eight angles of football, um, simply put, is similar to if you're looking at a compass uh, where you have north, south, east, west, your northeast, your southeast, your northwest, and your southwest. Those are kind of representative of those eight angles. So when I'm teaching the guys, we talk about our base angle, which is going straight forward, or we talk about our 45 degree angles in the run game, which uh, for, for, for our gap scheme friends is that down block that, that you always hear about, get a good down block in there. Or for our zone scheme guys, that's, um, you know, as much as I hate the term, your bucket step angles, things like that, um, you know, our as well as working on our pulling, which is our 90 degree angles, which is kind of opening up on trap pulls, uh, things like that, as well as our Southwest and Southeast angles, which is pass setting on our 45 degree angles. And of course, the one angle that I do teach, but I very rarely implement is that vertical set. But again, every movement within football, whether we're in pass or run is gonna fall on one of those eight angles. It might not be an exact 45 degrees or an exact 90 degrees or an exact straightforward, but it all will fall within that angle. So making sure that our guys understand those eight angles and learn to master them is an important part of our approach. Uh, the next piece, we talk about generating forceful and powerful movements. Um, I know that every coach I've ever played for and you know myself, we want our offensive line to be physical bring force and power. So, and as you'll see, as we talk about here a little bit in the mental approach that, and as we talk about how we teach things, our mind and our process starts from the ground up is how do we get our guys moving properly from the ground up? Because to generate those forceful and powerful movements, we have to learn to properly move on a football field. Uh, another thing within our physical approach that we do is we work on attacking half a man. And I understand that, you know, we, this is a physical game. It is, you know, wonderful. But as I tell the guys, we're going to be smart about how we're attacking. We're going to pinpoint landmarks that we want to attack a defender because just hitting the joker head on every time ain't going to work. 
So we want to find ways to force that defender that we're blocking. The only way he can beat us is a way that's not going to affect the play. So a lot of while we're talking, you're going to hear me referencing, focusing on landmarks and attacking half a man. The last thing, and I stress this to anybody that watches this, that is in charge of after practice conditioning or off season conditioning, which are offense alignment. It is not about how watching them die running full gas. If you want effective offensive line play, <coughs> sorry, if you want effective offensive line play, you have to find ways to do position based conditioning. Because I'm sorry, that that offensive lineman running five gassers at the end of practice is not going to make him better off in the fourth quarter when you got to run a two minute drill. But running stuff like two minute drills is what gets that guy into that condition. And, and I'm speaking from experience. And if you ask any other offensive line guy, former or present, that that is a true fact for us. All right, so with our mental approach, the first thing is we eliminate passive verbiage. Passive verbiage means anything that we're teaching our kids, we wanna teach them with the mindset of being aggressive and attacking. So when we describe movement, we describe, hey, I need you to drive this angle to violently strike the opponent here, not you're going to take one step and then two steps, and then you're going to punch. Okay. It, I mean, it, 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 not just within football, not just within the game of football. If you look at studies, how you communicate with your players is huge in preparation because we talk all the time. And I know I've mentioned this earlier. We talk all the time about being able to get kids physically ready for a game, that's only half of it. Because if your kids are not mentally prepared, your kids will not be effective. So getting those kids wired to understand that it's gotta be a physical and aggressive moment will translate to them being physical and aggressive when they have to execute. But, if you talk to the kids passively, when they go to execute and they execute something passively, you can't get mad at them. But yet that's something that we always do as coaches. So again, that's why number one thing for me when developing the mental approach is we have to eliminate passive verbiage. Everything we do has to structure these guys, getting them mentally prepared to go physically execute what we want and how we want it executed. The second is myself and my offensive linemen have to have the have to have the following mentality with one another. I do not I'll be honest, I do not know if I stole this from somebody or if I just randomly came up with it and didn't know it. But I call it the boat. We're all on this boat together. Boat stands for balanced, open, available, and trusting and truthful. Balanced. Yeah, we're here to work, but we also got to have some fun because at the end of the day, this game, this game is just that. It's a game. Everybody gets to leave the game. Hopefully all healthy, but everybody has to go home. Everybody has, you know, everybody will leave the game. Open. I'm going to be honest with my guys. You know, if, if I'm wrong on something, I'll admit it because I want to set that example so that if my guys become wrong on something, they don't try to hide and repress it. Too many times we as coaches forget that we are a role model. Maybe not the role model for our kids, but we are an important role model for our kids. And if we can't be open about when we make mistakes, we again, we can't get mad at a kid when they won't admit their faults as well. So be open with your guys. If you make a mistake, I screwed it up. I, I can't tell you how many times I might, I, I, I possibly contradicted myself. But because I'm open about accepting the fact that I'm flawed and I can make mistakes, my kids respect me more. 
than just, you know, how it was when I was playing where I'm God, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm the supreme authority. Nothing is, nothing is above me and I'm infallible. That thing can't fly, especially not in today's culture with this game. Uh, the A is available. I am available to my guys 24 hours a day, seven days a week. They all got one of these daggone cell phones, right? Uh, because available isn't just about football either. Either It's available to be that support, to be that role model, to help them out. Because football takes up, what, four hours a day that you're with them? What about the other 20? hours in a day because not every kid is the same situation so you got to be available to your guys so they understand they love you and the last thing truthful and trust and uh, uh, truthful and trusting is i know that for us to work and for us to be successful we have to have trust in one another and with trust comes some truths being honest with some kids all right. Too many times these kids get fed, you know, too many times in life, people feed each other dishonest or non-truths or like those little white lies to get what you want and get moving. These kids are way smarter than, than, than ever before. They know if you're not being honest with them. So be truthful with them and find a way to, and, and, you know, if you find a way to do it without necessarily, uh, you know, without necessarily completely destroying their spirit, that's awesome. But be truthful with the kids because you want them to be truthful with you. All right. And our mentality with, uh, with, and our mentality about anybody we face is CNA. We're going to be cerebral, we're going to be cerebral, nasty, physical, and aggressive. Cerebral, we're going to outthink our opponent. That means putting in the work, understanding what they like to do and how we can combat that. We're gonna be nasty physical. Again, like we talked about, we're eliminating passive verbiage. We're learning how to move on a field so that we can take the fight to, so that we can be nasty and physical and impose our will on somebody and aggressive. We're gonna take the fight to them. I always tell the kids uh, that I coach with offensive line, we are the alpha and we are the omega. We are the beginning and we are the end of the offense. If we do not come out firing, the offense is coming out flat. And if we do not bring an end to what the defense wants to do, we're gonna lose. So we are the alpha, we are the omega. The other thing that we focus on within our philosophy is building our offensive line meeting, rule, uh, meeting, uh, meeting room rules. So our universal requirements, everybody's following the boat method, coaches, players, how we sit in the meeting rooms is now in high school, this is a little bit more difficult, but at the college level, we have our section and the first row is first string, second row right behind them, second string, third row, anybody that's in third string. And then I will file in either in that third row or if we got a full third string, God help me one day, I'd love to see that. I'll be in the fourth row. But we sit together because I will talk to my guys during film. I will not disrupt the OC if it's not me, but I want them all together because much like on the field where they're together and they got to communicate, they have to get used to that. Again, it's putting them in situations, getting them ready. All right. My requirements for my players, for offense alignment, for meeting room, doesn't matter if it's individual meeting or it's team meeting or offense meeting. You're going to arrive five minutes early. Uh, again, uh, one of the things I picked up from when I was playing was Lombardi time. And that was always, if you're on time, you're five minutes late. And if you're five minutes early, you're always on time. Okay. They will always bring pencil, paper, and if there's a physical copy of the playbook. Their focus, when they're in the meeting, we have to push everything else to the side. Anything else that's bothering us, we got to push that thing to the side and be focused on what we're doing in that meeting. Same thing I'm requiring of myself, right? I require my kids to be there five minutes early. I'm requiring myself to try to be there no less than 15 minutes ahead of time so I can get myself set up. 
in the meeting room so I can have all my things ready as well as lists of questions I need to ask the guys, answers to things that I think might come up as well as having paper ready to write things down, having reference to the playbook with my supplies. And just like them, clear my mind of everything other than what we got to cover at the meeting because it's all about getting us ready mentally. All right, so our fundamentals, uh, the things, and now with fundamentals guys understand that with this, if you ever show up to a practice I'm running, fundamentals are things you're gonna see every day, no matter what. No matter what else is on the docket, these four things, stance, start, striking, fit and finish, will be four things that have done every time we step on a football field, regardless of whether we're just helmets or we're full gear about to bang that day. All right, so some basics about stance that I kind of have taken as truth, okay? The first thing is this, your stance as an offensive lineman is a weapon because when you use it properly and you get in a proper stance, you can eliminate 90% of things that, of things that can go wrong in the process. The other important thing about your stance is no matter what as an offensive lineman, you always have to start in it. So being in a proper stance is huge. Um, normally I would try to butcher a quote, but today I'm not going to, <laughs> but it did relate to stance. But again, your stance is huge because it is the start of everything for an offensive lineman, every play, no matter if it's run or pass. So us working on our stance is a non-negotiable, hence why, hence why it is a fundamental. Our focus, when we're building our stance is we want to create, we want our guys to envision turning themselves into a coil that's being compressed, just ready to get released when the, when the ball is snapped. And we're building that coil by building the 345s within our body. So that if I were to take a, if I were to take a protractor, if I remember correctly from my schooling days and measure the hip, the knee, and the ankle area for our guys, I'm getting 345 degree angles. All right. Yeah. I hate how I set up this video. <laughs> so anyways, so right here, we're gonna have a video for you guys to kind of watch the progression um, after I talk through everything in terms of how we build our stance progression and how we do it. So the first thing we talk about is our base. I always tell my guys a good reference point is to start with your feet slightly outside your shoulders and then widen your feet depending on what is necessary. The goal is to find a comfort point for your athlete so that if you were to walk around and push on their shoulder from the waist up, they might move, but from the waist down, their feet they've built a base so that nothing moves. So that's how you know they're in a good balance point, okay? Our stagger and our pigeon is our second step. Depending on what side of the ball the old line athlete gets on, um, it determines what leg they stagger. If they're on the right side, it's gonna be a right foot stagger. If it's on the left side, it's a left foot stagger, okay? Now, the level of that stagger, again, I put that on the athlete. You have to find what feels comfortable. There are some kids that do not feel comfortable. You know, I've seen it before, the tackles that have that back leg so far back and it kind of looks like they're kind of tilted a little bit. There are some kids that think that's comfortable. That's comfortable, that's comfortable, all right? But again, finding your base and finding your stagger is all about your balance and finding that point where you where your body has a perfect balance so that if you're getting pushed around, the lower half of your body is in control, okay? Now, which you're, when, when you have the kids pigeon their foot, again, it's a comfort thing. They wanna try to shoot for a 45 degree angle. The more open that angle gets, too much stress gets put on ligaments in the knee and it can lead to some problems. 
All right, step three, we talk about locking in the hip. This is for me, how I teach these guys a good way to teach them how to engage their adductor muscles. Uh, for those of us that aren't sure what adductor muscles are, those are those interior leg muscles that we use to tighten when you close your legs and your adductors, adductors are the ones that are in charge when you're trying to widen out your legs. These muscles are crucial in creating a stable base, okay? When we talk about priming our body, this is when we're priming our upper body by, by trying to pinch our shoulder blades together. Thus, you know, essentially prepping our upper body to understand that, hey, when we come out of this stance, we're about to be physical with somebody. We're about to be aggressive. So we have to prime our body to get us right, to get our upper body engaged, just like we're focused so much on engaging our lower half. While we're priming our body, I teach my guys to take the, the, the part of their palm, the part of their wrist right past their palm and let it ease down gradually until it gets to overtop the kneecaps. Because once it's gotten there, their body, their upper body will have a natural tilt forward that's proportionate for their body and in a comfortable place, okay? And then if you want your guys in a three-point stance, the final step would be put having them get their hand, you know, having their hand touch the ground. With us, when I teach a three-point stance, I have them drop the hand straight to the ground. I do not, I'm not a firm believer in trying to reach out further with the hand because then what you're doing is you're forcing your offensive line athlete to shift his weight and he become and he ends up becoming one way where he can't be able to execute run or pass. When you look at my offensive line athletes, how I like to do it, I want them in a position where we can run block or pass protect and we don't have to change up our stance to do so. So here you go, here's video. So right here is, Jesus. Right here is base. Again, notice this is EJ. This is a kid that's actually from my alma mater. I was helping him for a little bit, get ready for uh, his draft and his free agency combine. And over here is a young man I coached at the high school level that's currently at en uh, Elon College, or Elon University. And if you notice with them, they're both tackles, but notice their width. Each one's different because, again, every offensive line athlete is different. There is no cookie-cutter approach to this where you put somebody in a box and they got to execute. Everybody has a different level. So now here we go. We talk about getting our stag. Oh, Jesus, I did it again. Sorry, guys. All right. So right here, this is our stagger and our pigeon phase. Again, notice. Both of them are about the same. It looks about heel to toe. But for your guards, it might be heel to instep. That might be what they're more comfortable with. Or there's some guys that might be a little further. Again, it becomes to them. But notice with the pigeon, both of them are pretty much on a 45 degree angle from straight ahead. Three. Now, a big thing I always do, and I always like how EJ does it, exaggerates locking yourself in, locking your hips in, getting your shoulders back squared to the line of scrimmage and engaging those adductor muscles. Zane never really was much for the, uh, the over-exaggeration, but again, over-exaggeration in this process helps the kids understand what has to happen. Four. So now, again. Five. Dear God. One of these days, coach, I'm going to figure out how to do this. But again, if you notice, we're engaged, we're locked, we're primed, and at four, we're in a good position. So now we can run block out of this, we can pass block out of this. We're ready to go. Five. And then, like I said, if you want to do an offensive lineman stance with three-point stance, both guys will drop that arm straight down. So again, we can pass set or we can run block. But again, this is something that we do in our practice every day is work on their stance because it is the most important piece. All right. So now we talk about our starts, which is our next important piece. 
All right. The basics for our starts. We got to teach our offensive linemen how to be powerful and agile, power and agility. All right. The next thing, this is where, again, teaching the kids about our eight angles on the football field comes into playing because we want our kids to understand that we're building the power of these starts so that we can own these angles. All right. This is also where we start learning about generating our force for when we've got to strike somebody. Okay. So this is why this is what, this is how I teach these guys. This is why the starts are important. Our drill progression we go through and I've got video for you guys on this is our ice skater drills. Then we work to working on our starts off a knee and then we work on our starts out of our stance. Everything we do with a progression is building up kids to what they have to execute in real life. Like that's the biggest thing for me with building these progressions. All right, and finding the ways I like to execute. All right, so the first thing is our first progression It's called our ice skater drill. All right. So our ice skater, I call it an ice skater drill because one of the ways that I heard it uh, heard it talked about with OLP, okay, uh, was teaching kids to drive off the opposite leg. And one of the sports where it's essential to learn how to drive off your opposite leg is professional speed skating. All right. Is speed skating. So we call this, so I've affectionately named this drill the ice skater drill. This is the best way for me to, you know, teach the kids. A lot of times, if I can, I will actually pull up video of speed skaters so the kids can watch the process and how it's done. But the importance of this progression, we're going to teach the kids the building, the, the, some of the building blocks of drive catch, driving off the opposite leg to generate force through the ground and propel us on our angles. All right. Another thing that we try to emphasize, especially with the ice skater drill, this is where we learn how, how much power we need to generate to execute a movement, right? We learn, okay, I've driven off that opposite leg. When I drive with this force, this is how I land. The other thing we're teaching these kids is how to control their body by driving off the opposite leg. And as they're catching, in that catch phase, they're going to learn to catch on the insides of their feet. All right. Again, to learn our body control. And most importantly, to me, the point of emphasis with this drill is this teaches the kids to trust their body and understand how it feels when you're executing a movement properly versus improperly. One of the toughest things when teaching kids new movements they will be hesitant because they've never done it before. Being able to start with this progression teaches these kids that, you know what, I can execute this movement and I can trust it. So again, we nope. talk about our ice skater drill. Kids are learning to drive catch, driving off the opposite leg. They're learning how to generate power and force. They're learning how to control their body by keeping on the insides of their feet. And most importantly, they're learning that they can actually, that their body can actually execute what I'm, I'm asking them to do. All right. There we go. Sorry about that. Sorry about that, guys. All right. So our next piece, our second progression, once they've understood the ice skater drill, the next piece that we put them into is starts off of a knee, okay? If you notice on this PowerPoint, our points of emphasis are exactly the same with one exception. The only thing that changes is instead of they're learning to trust their body, that now we're taking this movement and translating it into something that's more like the real thing, more like what they're going to do in a game, okay? So again, everything else is going to be the same. We're going to work on driving, generate that power, trusting to drive off the opposite leg by putting their lead leg in the ground. 
That way they've got to learn how to be fluid and drive those angles. That on the top was your base angle. On the bottom, again, for you gap scheme guys, that's a down block. For you zone scheme guys, that's your zone scheme. That's your 45 play side. Our third progression. One of these days, baby. I'm going to figure out videos correct. Sorry about that, coach. All right, so now our third progression. We're doing starts out of our stance because, again, the points of emphasis, we still want to focus on drive catch. We still want to generate that power. We still want that body control. But now we've progressed to this is the real deal. This is you having to execute just like when you're on the field. You have to get a good start out of your stance, okay? All right. Our third thing that we're going to work on every day, no matter what, is we're going to work on striking. All right. Now, for us, the basics of this is striking. First off, striking starts from the ground up. Okay. It has to. You will never generate as much force just trying to strike someone with just your upper body than you will if you're generating your strike from the ground up. You ask boxers, when they're throwing punches, when they're delivering blows, everything starts from the ground up. So it's gotta start from the ground up with us too, all right? The other thing, one of those eliminate passive words like we talked about earlier, I refer to things as you need to strike the defender, not, throw, not throwing a punch, okay? <clears throat> Now, in order to properly strike someone, in order to deliver a proper blow from the ground up, we have to keep our, we have to learn to put our body in optimal leverage points, okay? This, you know, you, I know we've all used the expression, low man wins and stay low and all this good stuff, all right? And, and don't get me wrong, being low is important, but your kid being in his optimal body position is more important because then he can properly transfer his power that he's generated from the ground up. A six, five kid and a five foot 10 kid will never be the same level on a playing field. So it's about finding optimal leverage an optimal leverage position for that kid's body to deliver a blow. Okay. Ready or not, as I tell the kids, we, we as offensive line athlete, athletes have to have our body ready to do one of two things, either deliver a strike or absorb a blow, depending on the situation. If we're in the run game, we have to be in the optimal leverage body position to deliver a blow, to deliver a strike, to try to dig that guy out the hole. But if we're in pass protection, we have to have our body in its optimal leverage position ready to handle absorbing some kind of blow and still execute our block. Another piece that we focus on is hands or palms. Again, uh, your guys, uh, the, the toughest part of your hand is your palm. So when I teach my guys about striking, it's about making sure that we're leading with our palms and not our fingers, all right? I've still got fingers jammed up from college ball because I didn't do it the right way. I've still got some fingers that won't pop to this day because of it. All right. Another piece too that we try to focus on is that delivering a strike to a defender is not always just double uppercuts. Okay. There are so many different games and so many different ways to deliver a blow unilaterally using one hand and then bringing the other. It's not always a bilateral thing where it's got to be both hands at the same time. So that's something that we try to focus on as well. Some of the drills here that I'll show you, uh, you know, as we talk, is we have a mechanics drill where we will literally put those guys into their optimal leverage position and they just work on delivering either bilateral strikes with both hands or we work on unilateral strikes with one hand and the other. Again, learning how to properly work within that optimal leverage position. 
Uh, two drills that I do not have film on right now, but I'm sure I will as the spring rolls around is we have we have our how we're striking when we're trying to reach and overtake opponents. And then uh, a fun one I call is the fishing drill when we're trying to go get that defensive player to commit what he's doing by using a little bit of a hand flash or some kind of a setup with a hand. All right, so our lower half. So these are the mechanics of what we talk about. Our lower half, we're properly engaged. That means we got our correct base for our body. Our abductors are engaged. Our, our hips are locked in like they're supposed to. All right, we talk about our power generation. We're gonna make sure that we're gonna continue to use our drive catch, even in the strike phase. All right, and we also talk with the guys. I'm not here to throw a jab. I'm here to bring everything with me. The best thing, the best way I always tell a guy is like this. When you're delivering a strike, do you want to strike somebody with just whatever you can bench press? Or do you want to be able to strike somebody with your bench, your squat, your deadlift, and your cleans? Because if you want to be able to do that with all that damn hard work you don't put in the gym, it's about drive catch. It's about generating your strike from the ground up. Another piece that we really focus on in the mechanics phase is we want to make sure our guys are engaging their core and engaging their chain of command. All right, because we're working so hard on generating this force to deliver an amazing strike. But if our core is not engaged and our chain of command within our upper body is not engaged, that power will not transfer and you end up with a jab, which we cannot do. Now, how do we engage our chain of command? I always teach the kids with this process. It's, it's a fun process for me and for the kids because they realize just how important hand placement is, how important proper body mechanics work. Engaging our chain of command for us is we're taking our thumbs and rotating them outward. Because when we rotate our thumbs outward, one, it presents our palm as the leading, as the leading point of contact. The next thing that happens is if we, if you rotate your palms right now, if you put your hands straight out and then rotate your palms, you're gonna feel your elbow naturally wanna tuck into the side of your body. The next thing that happens, you're gonna feel your shoulder properly rotate and lock into place. And then you're gonna feel your pectoral muscle fire. Just by the simple act of rotating our thumbs out to engage our chain of command, we've essentially properly set our upper body, our upper body's chain of command into the appropriate position to either absorb a blow or deliver a blow. And like I said, core work is huge for offensive linemen so that we can transfer that power. All right. Hands are ready. Um, th this key to me, uh, you know, it, it, it it's, it's something that I was taught that even when I was taught, I felt was off. Um, I get that at a young level, we teach the kids, come out of your stance and reach for your guns. To me, that's counterproductive. I come out of my stance from where my hands are, they've got to be ready to get used. We don't have time to put our hands, send our hands backwards and go forwards. Because when you really think about it, you're trying to move forward. You're trying to attack that angle forward and your hands going back is naturally going to slow you down or it's going to make you, it's going to make you slightly hesitant. And when that happens, your hands go back, you're presenting your chest. You're giving that defense alignment, a target to long arm you, or you're giving that defense alignment, a target to bull rush you. And that just spells losing. That's setting your kid up for failure. Of course, I could be wrong. And if you found a good way to do guns to that and it works consistently, I'd love to see it. Please send it to me. I just I, personally, I feel that where our hands are, when our stance starts, we've got to be able to go from where they start in the stance to straight into an attack. It's about getting hands on. 
And it's about getting there with speed and efficiency, okay? The last thing we talk about with our mechanics, with our guys, is we clarify. You're not, you're not trying to punch this guy. You're trying to strike through the defender. Don't punch to him, strike through him. All right, this video is a high school kid. Um, probably uh, the kid I, I taught when I was doing personal training. Uh, he's a lot he's a lot older now than he was when I worked with him. But this is about 50% speed. The kid holding the bag is 300 pounds and that bag is not a light bag. And this kid's going about 50% speed. All right, we talk about striking through the defender, bring everything through the bag, through the defender. Everything is drive your angle, strike through the defender, not just get to this guy and punch him. Because again, it goes back to mentally prepping your guys as much as physically. All right. <clears throat> Sorry about that. All right, so the last part of the drill that we're going to work on every day, the last thing we're going to work on is our fit and finish, okay? So the first three things we covered, that's the first half of a block. Everything from your stance to your start to your strike is the first half of the block. Your fit and finish is the other half of this block. It's like, hey, you did all this work to get to them. Now we got to finish it off. You got to stay with them, all right? Another thing that I tell a lot of coaches, and sometimes I get a side eye, your fit and finish process, you know, we, we watch a kid, he gets to the block, and then the defender comes off the block. Okay, we get it, you gotta fix something, but this is not the first place that you should be looking to analyze. Well, why can't you stay with him, little Timmy? Well, you know what? If little Timmy was in a bad stance, Little Timmy's going to be off balance as he's going to block. So now when little Timmy engages that guy and he's off balance and that guy sheds him, was it really the fact that little Timmy couldn't fit and finish or is it because little Timmy was off balance from the start? So that's why I tell the guys, just because you can't necessarily fit and finish is not the place to be trying to analyze what's wrong. Retrace your steps first to make sure his stance was correct. He came with a proper start and that he did a good job on his strike before you say, oh, well, little Timmy can't fit and finish the play, okay? The other piece with our fit and finish within the basics is the KISS method. Keep it simple, stupid. Keep it simple, stupid, all right? Because this is the part of the block where you need your kids to go out and just be athletes. Let them be an athlete. Don't over crit, don't overthink it. Let that kid be an athlete and make a play. Just like you tell the wide receiver to go up and catch that ball or tell that quarterback, man, just cut it loose and see what happens. Let your offense alignment in this phase be an athlete. Don't overcoach this. Keep it simple. All right. The way we work on this, it primarily is our pressure field drill. I've kind of remove the replacement drill from the process just because I need to rework it. All right. Go, go. So our fit and finish drills. Okay. I'm uh, sorry. Our pressure Got field it. drill. All right. I call it a pressure field because our guys are starting this already locked up. So they've already struck their defender and now the game is on the game is afoot. So their job is to engage Engage the defender. And when the drill starts, feel where the bag's working them. And then they adjust themselves accordingly to the blocks. Okay. Sorry. Again, an important part with engaged body. We've started on our stance engaged. We've done our starts while engaged. We focused on being engaged when we strike. And we still got to make sure our guys are staying engaged in this phase of the as in this phase of the block as well. So it's important. All right. So the top guy again, 
It's a former Wolf Pack. Woo! Former Wolf Pack guy like myself. All right. He was much better than I was, probably. Oh. All right. But again, if you notice, you watch him. It's all about right now. He's driving. He feels the defender moving, and it's his job to mirror that defender. Feel his pressure, react to his pressure, and stay with him. Again, the young high school guy is still working on it, but again, it's the same thing. I feel the pressure. I react to the pressure. So allow them to just be athletes. They've locked in on the guy. They've struck him. Feel him. Move with him. Okay? Uh, feeling him and moving with him uh, and within the OLP community would be pressure to pressure. You fight pressure with pressure. All right? So that concludes the, the fundamentals. Now, some essentials like a talk that I'd like to talk with you guys about. I have some different styles of how I have guys execute combo blocks, uh, double teams, and some pass pro basics that you can kind of use with your guys. All right. So the thing that we focus on, all right. Yes, you see gap style scheme combo and zone style scheme combo. Got, got to have both. All right. The first thing that we want to focus on when we're teaching kids about combo blocks is we want to understand what the defenders are taught to do to defeat double team blocks. All right. So when I talk with my guys, I talk with them about how defenders are going to try to attack one of you to then try to split you to attack, separate, split between. All right. And how they'll, uh, or as uh, one D line coach I used to work with said, get skinny in between the two offensive linemen. Okay. So that's the first important piece. We talk about being cerebral. I want to talk about my guys being cerebral. That means my guys got to understand what the defender is trying to do to them. All right. So now we talk about that half a man approach within our double team. Each one of our guys is going to do two things. They're going to be responsible for their gap, but they're also going to be responsible for half of that defender. Okay. The other piece is the kids understanding that this is a two part combination block. This is a two piece combo block. Each one of you has one of the pieces and each part is essential to the success of that double team. And finally, the last thing we really focus on is that universal rule. And that universal rule is we're never going to leave the combo block unless we are forced to do so. And the only way that we can be forced to do so is the linebacker that we're tracking is forcing us to separate to the double to separate the double team or the post player has an inside threat that he has to take right now okay <clears throat> so and i'll explain the two parts of the combo block here in a second but our drills that we work we work a gap style combo block I call it gap style because this is the style of double team that we will use on gap scheme running plays, power, counter, okay? We have a zone style combo block because again, if we're running inside zone, run a wide zone, stretch, whatever you wanna call it, we're going to work this style of combo block. They, they are exclusive to the, to the scheme that we're running, all right? So first thing that we'll clarify real fast is the two pieces of the combo block. Our, so this is our gap scheme combo block. Our inside player, this is our play side. Let's say this is the play side guard and we're running power left. This inside guard, this inside offensive lineman, he is our post player. All right. 
as we know, a gap scheme, the play side of the offensive line is responsible for their inside gap. So the first thing about this combo block, this post guy has to understand, I am responsible for the inside gap, the A gap. Just like this play side tackle has to understand, it's power, it's a gap scheme play, I'm responsible for my B gap, okay? Now, we also know that because there's no immediate threat here, we're gonna double team. Our post player is in charge of attacking the, play, the near half of the defender while keeping his eyes on the A-gap, all right? That is his job. His job is not to win this double team. His job is to gain some ground, to, to attack and gain just a little bit of ground, but then post up, as I tell my guys, post up that defense alignment. Get that defense alignment's attention on you. You literally want him to try to split you. That is your job. Engage him, post up, control. Don't worry about vertically pressing him or driving him. My backside, my play side tackle here is my cleanup piece of the double team. His job is to violently drive this B gap to the backside backer. His job, is, as I say to cleanup man, his job is to clean house. In an optimal world, he drives through this near hip of the defender and knocks him onto the A gap and then keeps moving to take that backside backer. Again, in a perfect world, that's how it works. If it doesn't work that way, and this, this is a thick, heavy kid that's holding his ground, you just keep driving the B gap and you and that center will just keep working to the backside guy. All right. Because again, we want to follow that universal rule of no matter what, we do not come off the double team unless we're forced to. So up top here is an example of if things go right, this get, there's no stunt or blitz on or anything like that. Go. Again, working slow so we can talk about the mechanics. But again, go. we're right here. The guard does a good job. Uh, he uh, guard could have done a better job of gaining me just a little bit more ground. But again, his job is not to win the double team. His job is to post it up to get that guy's attention on him. It's the job of this guy to win that double team, that tackle. It's this tackle's job to win the double team. Now, again, the bottom video here, we talk about, well, what happens if we're playing a team that likes to stunt, right? Because we see that. We see guys that like to stunt inward. You know, they'll slant the defensive line. They'll play games. So now the reason why that doesn't concern me is as follows. If we're trusting our rules, if we're following our rules of protecting our gap, this guy understands he's going away from me. I've got to follow my universal rule, which is above all else, the A gap is my responsibility. Because my guy left, I'll go track the linebacker. All right. Go. Thus, we eliminate confusion with this style of double team and understanding our universal rule. All right, continuing, continuing. All right, so we talked about our gap scheme combo. Now we're going to talk about our zone scheme combos. All right, so again, keeping the same elements. We got a post, a cleanup, and our universal rule. Our universal rule, uh, you know, we'll just say this is stretched to the right. This tackle has his play side gap. That has got to be his responsibility, no matter what we're trying to do. Just like this guard, his responsibility is this play side gap. No matter what, it's his job above all else. But since there's no immediate threats, we can try to double team. Okay? So, again, the postman's job is to secure his gap, 
post up the down defender, or in this case, the head up defender. And then his job is to protect this gap. His job is not to win the block. Understood? It's this guy's job to win the block here. He's the cleanup guy. His job is to come clean house and then push this lineman, push his play side lineman up to the next level because he's secure. Okay. Go. Just like that. Again, the way I Go. tell the guys, your job is to secure this gap, post him up. It's your cleanup man's job to come in and clean it up for you so that you can then climb. Because one of two things is going to happen. I know with a bag and a guy standing still, it's not easy. But now, if we do this, that end is either going to shoot out, and that just means he stays with him, and then the guard climbs, or this end's going to try to shoot inside. The guard takes him over, and then the tackle climbs. No matter how you want to twist and stunt this, we have these two for these two, and we have, we have what we need out of it. It's on the running back to make a move after that. One more time. Go. All right. Good. All right, so our pass pro stuff. One thing that I always try to focus within our pass pro stuff is that we still have to subscribe to the eight angles of movement with our pass pro. We still have to focus on taking half a man. We're attacking different techniques, which is something that a lot of people don't necessarily put a lot of thought into. And then we still have to focus on our fit and our finish. All right. So the drills we work, we work on kneeling angle starts to work on how we set on our 45 and then how we recover versus an inside move. All right. Next thing we work on is our technique sets, which I've got video for you. And then the last thing is a pressure field drill. All right. So our points of emphasis on our pass setting. All right. Again, we talk about focusing on drive catch, driving off that opposite leg to generate force through the ground to generate our power. And we really got to focus on our body control because when you think about it, this is an offensive lineman that's having to work either diagonally backwards or if you do teach that vertical set straight backwards and has to have their body in control to be able to handle a variety of rushes coming their way. Okay, so we break it down into two stages. The first stage, again, we're focused on our drive catch generating power and we focus on our body control being able to set and stick our landings. Go. The next piece that we focus on in stage two is we're being able to stick our landing, but now make our readjustment versus an inside move. Go. All right. A lot of times to start this drill off, I'll tell them, give me three sets. Give me three 45s. And then the next time around, I'll say, okay, Give me three 45s and then give me a recovery. Recovery to us is talking about handling an inside move. So my guys, will, my guys will understand. Hey, give me three sets. All right, now give me three sets with recovery. And they have to recover back versus inside move. Some guys, guys, it's important to understand your guys have to find a recovery that fits best for them. Okay, some guys it's they can handle it on more of a sharp angle, but some guys can handle it on more of a flat angle. Again, you have to invest that time and that kid has to invest that time to find what works best. The important thing is that you focus on their body engagement when they are recovering back inside. Because if that inside hip becomes loose and open, instead of it being flat or at a sharp angle, it's going to open up and the kid's going to become a revolving door for that defense alignment making an inside move. Go. All right. Go. 
All right, so I've kind of got it mapped out. We talk about setting versus different techniques. And coach, I know you and I joked around about this a little bit before we got going. But one of the things that I have my guys work on and we try to make sure, and, and a lot of times I'll try to make some time and practice for this, but this is one of those things I encourage those guys. Yeah, you want to stay late and hit the sled. Well, why don't you stay late with a buddy and work on setting your technique? A little bit all right so the top left here is how we how i teach my guys to set versus a head up technique all right uh for you guys that deal with a lot of odd fronts this is dealing with a 404 all right this is a good way to teach your tackles if they're on the back side of their man versus that head up guy this is how you can set this guy to put yourself in an optimal body position because again, in pass pro, just like the run game, we want to attack half a man if possible, okay? Because when we attack a half a man, we follow the golden rule, which is we're not going to get beat inside. If you're beating me, you're going outside, you're running the hump, and you're doing a lot of work to get there. You got to earn that one. No freebies by coming inside. Go. All right, so when we talk about this with my guys, the first thing we talk about is you're going to have that set. Your first movement is going to be to set inside, all right? Because I tell my guys a lot of times, nine out of 10, you got a head up guy, there is a very real possibility he's spiking inside on you, especially at the high school level and even still at the college level, depending. So your first set is inside. If he isn't trying to blast across your face, you're then going to reset yourself, ensure that you're splitting the crotch, ready to take half a man. All right. The next thing, we talk about a tight shade. Now, I'm not a huge fan of vertical setting, but I do understand sometimes you do have to vertical set to buy yourself space and time. For the guys I teach, that vertical set moment is if you're dealing with a tight shaded uh, defender. So in this case, it's going to be a vertical set, still trying to maintain the idea that our foot is gonna split the crotch of the defender and our eyes are gonna go to the near shoulder, the nearest shoulder of the defender. Both of these things help one another out. That way, again, we're splitting this guy in half and trying to play half a man. I kind of left that part out in the beginning, so I do apologize about that, guys. But yeah, the key tenets of our pass protection is we want to split their crotch with that outside leg, and we want our eyes to go to the nearest shoulder. We're not worried about being eye to eye. We're not worried about eyes on the near numbers. It's his near shoulder, and it's our foot splitting his crotch. That is the ultimate goal for us. We want to take away any possibility of the inside to force this guy to go wide. It's a little bit, it's a little bit wide by Zane, but again, this kid was kind of standing one foot behind the other. So I wasn't necessarily mad about that set. All right. Now the bottom two here is when we're dealing with wider shaded individuals. Again, I'm not a fan of, I'm not a fan of vertical setting. For this i am a fan of setting on a 45 again keeping the tenant of my outside leg is going to split his crotch my eyes are drawn to his nearest shoulder so that i can track and i can force him wide and now as we set we're telling our guys if your eyes are following his shoulder as you set your body is naturally going to turn itself how it needs to as you're setting on your 45 and it's it, and you're going to put yourself in a good position. Because I mean, if you notice, it's not overtly, it, it's not so plainly obvious, but as you watch him set on a 45 and as you watch his eyes track the shoulder, his body ever so slightly starts to turn a little bit. And the more he has to move and the more he has to go, you'll see it. But this and how he's doing it is where we should be. 
the thing that you see a lot of times with kids trying to speed out of there is this hip becomes soft because they lose engagement. That hip flails open. And then that's when you see these guys converting speed, whether it's just a straight speed rush or it's speed to power. They really press that. And then this kid opens up, becomes a revolving door. But again, nice and firm, engaged, slightly widens, finds the crotch, and is slightly rotating. The same thing here with this young man here setting to the left. Again, you get a slight rotation. I don't like how he kind of sits down at the end and pokes and puffs his chest out. I think that's a bad situation, and I did tell him so. All right. The last thing we work on with our pass with our pass pro is same thing we worked on within the run game. We talk about our 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 pressure feeling, right? Feeling the pressure, learning to react to it. All right, <clears throat> we position our O line athletes ready, fitting into their block versus the defender, and we're teaching them to fight pressure with pressure. This, especially within the pass game, is important. Because once we've engaged with that defender, if we're trying to guess where he's going, we're in trouble. So learning to feel to, to engage that defender with a proper strike and absorb his blow, but then feel him and react to where he's moving, not trying to guess what he's doing. Okay. And no matter what, we always have to make sure we have a solid base. I appreciate you, coach, for the opportunity, man. Definitely. Thank you so much for sharing your wisdom. And, you know, we love it to be able to pass it on and help other coaches and young men uh, learn the skills and improve on their craft. So thank you so much. Oh, yeah. Yes, sir.